welcome back to our next episode of What's Up Prof. Hello, Walter. Hi. I was thinking, how are you coping with all the opposition that we have been getting in the last three months? Well, yes, uh, we do have opposition, but you know, I had a very encouraging talk to someone who is an, a pilot. And he told me that when the wind is from the front, then the aeroplane gets more lift. And we want to go to a higher plane, so lift is a good thing. Amen. Yes. So I also see that we've got some new decorations on the table. No, they're actually old decorations. They were in the back here. <laughs> so there's been a swap. Uh, this is a beautiful ammonite. I don't know whether you can see it. I don't know how I should lift it up yeah, and to whom I should lift it up. but. Uh, it's a gorgeous fossil, and it's not millions of years old, yeah. because mineralization like this can take place within a very short period of time. And there are many, many uh, cases of that. So uh, this very young fossil, which is supposedly millions of years old, is a nice example of what we've been speaking about, a young Earth. A young Earth. Then there's another question that I would quickly want us to handle before we go into um, today's like, uh, discussion. And that is also on the age and the, the earth and so on. Just quick, the oil fields. Some people say that that also it c can it happen in a quick uh, Oh, absolutely. Period. Uh, there are cases of rapid oil formation. Now, what is oil? It's organic material. So it's microorganisms and dead organic uh, material that has been covered in the flood and then turned into oil. And basically, it is uh, material of living organisms that have decayed to become oil. And it can happen very, very rapidly. For example, coal formation is very similar. Uh, you know that you can make oil from coal. And uh, if you take the, uh, the ancient fence posts that they erected in, let's say, United States of America or other places, some of these posts have actually turned to coal in the bottom. Wow. And that's not millions of years. Now we're talking since colonization. So that is very rapid, yes. Yeah, thank you. And then just before we go on, I just want to explain to the viewers, especially that on the YouTube, the links that we provide that we always refer to, if you go underneath the description, there is a button that says show more. And all the links are provided there. Also, we so in other words, under the picture of the video that's yes. actually running, there is a description of what we're talking about, and there is a little link which says "Show more." A button. A button. Yes. Okay. If you click that "Show more" button, then you'll get the links that we refer to in there. Also, there you'll get contact details if you want to send questions to um, to us at Amazing Discoveries Africa. And then also, just underneath that, the f we usually pin all the links in the first comment underneath the, the um, video. And you also have to go to the button that says, show more. So that's just to clarify it for some people if you have difficulty finding the links. Will you open for us in prayer? Absolutely. Our loving Heavenly Father, today we are going to discuss the difference between the religion of Babylon and the religion of the Bible. And we need heavenly wisdom to understand all its ramifications. And so we ask for the presence of your Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, what are we going to talk about today? Well, today we're going to talk about Babylon. And we're going to talk about the loud cry message, which is the call of the, the fourth angel of Revelation 18. Uh, we did discuss, you know, all the events that are taking place, and we have very interesting things happening at the moment with the World Monetary Fund and uh, 
all of the reset that they want to have in place with the economies and the social relationships of, of uh, humanity and the nations. And you have this tremendous globalization push on the one hand mm. and then the contrast of the nationalistic push from the Trump team on the other hand and you have this interesting Hegelian dialectic going on but we, we will do that another time. Uh, I was very interested to see what he actually said at his Tulsa speech uh, recently and there it was very obviously a clash between globalism and nationalism yes. and uh, what Prince Charles had to say on the other side of the spectrum but uh, that is a discussion for something else. But why are we going to talk about Babylon? Because you know the Bible is so clear that we have to flee from Babylon just before Christ's coming. Is coming. And if we have to flee from Babylon why must we flee from Babylon? And the question of course is paramount, who is Babylon? And so we need to have a look at the issues as to why an organization can be part of Babylon in the times that we are living in. So if we can go to some of the slides that we've prepared uh, you can see the title is Babylon and the Doctrine of the Serpent. Now what is the Doctrine of the Serpent? Well, the, the Doctrine of the Serpent is made clear in the very first chapters of Genesis and in chap chapter 3 verse 1 of the book of Genesis we have the serpent saying and he said unto the woman, Yea, has God said? In other words he's saying, did God really say that? Ah... Uh, are you sure God said that? I'm sure he didn't mean that. He must have meant something else, yeah, right? Yeah. And then he negates what God said and he presents a counter theology. And that's the doctrine of the serpent. And if we analyze those issues, then we know what the, the theology of Babylon is all about and why it should be avoided. So it's very important that we we look into those issues, especially in the time where we are living, where this loud cry will go to the world very shortly. So, did God really say is a very important part of, uh, of the Bible. Genesis chapter 3, let's look at that verse in a little bit more detail. Now, the serpent was more subtle. That's a very important word, right? Yeah. Very descriptive word. He's subtle. Can it be linked to also to sneaky? Sneaky, absolutely, yes. Subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, has God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? They went to eat of this one particular tree. There was so much food there. And if we go a little bit back and see what the diet of man was, then uh, we can ask the question, did God really say that all the creatures ate plants? In Genesis 1 verse 29, God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree, yielding seed to you it shall be for meat, in other words for food. So the original diet, as we have seen, is every herb bearing seed. So those are all the seed plants, it's all the grains, all the seeds, uh, every tree with fruit on it, that's all the fruit trees and the nut trees and all of these. And that was the original food of man and the original food and diet of the, of the beasts of the earth and all the fowls of the air and everything that creeps upon the earth wherein there is life I have given every green herb for meat, for food and it was so. Mm. So everything on the planet was vegetarian. Yes. Now we've discussed some of these issues before, we don't have to go into it. But the question I'm asking is, in today's context, mm. 
do people really believe that everything was vegetarian? Yeah. Or do they think evolutionary and think that animals evolved and uh, obviously a carnivore uh, in evolutionary thinking has an advantage over a herbivore because he has to develop strategies to catch animals, etc., etc. So that eventually led to higher and higher intelligence. The other question, did God really say that there was only one way by which atonement could be secured? In other words, was there only one way of salvation? Because we have so many religions in the world, and uh, they all have different modes of salvation. So, did God really say that there was only one way? In Genesis chapter 4, verse 4, we read, And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and unto his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. So, the one that Abel brought was acceptable. God had respect unto Abel's offering mm. because he followed the guidelines. He had to bring a lamb. And if we go back into the Bible and we come to a future event where John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. It was of course a type, this firstling of the flock of Jesus Christ. And that is the way to salvation. There is no other name under heaven whereby we may be saved except the name Christ Jesus. That is a biblical criterion. But Cain said, no, I will bring the works of my hands. I will not follow this atonement path. So it seems that from the very beginning there is conflict about the way in which we are saved. Yes. And the Bible is very clear, right from the book of Genesis all the way through to the book of Revelation, Revelation that it is the Lamb of God that brings salvation to the earth. And there is no other way in which you can be saved. There is no other name under heaven whereby you may be saved. So, Cain's offering was not acceptable. But what was Cain's attitude when he's offering his own works when they were not accepted? He was very wroth mm. and his countenance fell. So obviously there is conflict even until today in terms of how are we saved. This is important. Yes. And the way of Cain eventually led to the way of Babylon. Mm. So the, the mode, this operandi of Babylon, in terms of the plan of salvation, is salvation by your own works. Yes. And the plan of the Bible is salvation by the Lamb of God. Another question that arises is, did God really say that there would be a day of judgment for the antediluvian world? So, obviously, there is a test, right? And man is judged according to his activities. So, this choice mm -hmm. is not just a haphazard choice. Uh, didn't you give a sermon on little things? Yes. And did God really say that you should not eat of the fruit of this tree? It, you said that was a little thing, but look at the big consequences that it had. So even though God is long-suffering, eventually there's a judgment. So in Genesis chapter 6 verse 3, we read, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. So Noah preached for 120 years. Now it's interesting that this, this number, 120, occurs quite regularly in the Bible. And uh, one wonders whether it has any additional meaning. Yes, in Genesis uh, chapter 6 verse 7 it says, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, 
and the creeping things, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. So there was going to be a judgment. And then the judgment came. God said unto Noah in verse 13, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence. That's a very important point. Through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood, rooms shall thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. So there is a way of escape. And this was the ark. And if you were in the ark, then you had followed the way of escape. Yes. How many people were in the ark? Eight. Eight. Now, you know, it's interesting when you go into biblical numerology, then eight, the number eight is often associated with, with Jesus. Mm. Because uh, uh, if you want to look at it, he was resurrected on the first day, which is actually the eighth day in the cycle. And there, there are many, many places. There are many, many books on numerology. You can study it. Uh, I don't go into it in great detail, but the number eight is associated with Jesus and the number six is associated with the arch enemy of Jesus, right? Mm. So maybe the number eight, just the speculation, uh, is those that are in Christ for the end time, if we apply it. So not just eight people at the end, but those that are in Christ. Yes. Just, a, just a thought. So. You know, this idea of 120 years is also fascinating. So Noah preached for 120 years, and after the 120 years, there was a judgment. Yes. And those that were violent were destroyed in the flood. And only those that were safe in the ark were saved. Mm. Now, it's interesting that Moses was also 120 years old yes. when the children went into Canaan yes. and the Canaanites were dispossessed and Moses died and was resurrected, resurrected. Mm. because he went to heaven because he appeared uh, to Jesus and the disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration. So there was a special resurrection, and we read it about it in the book of Jude, where there was this conflict with the devil yes. over the body of Moses. So here again, in Moses' case, it was 120 years. And then you have, the 120 occurs many times in the Bible. Uh, the 40, 40 days, and the 40 day cycles, and the 40 year cycles, and uh, all of these, they always or tended to come in threes. So 40, 40, 40 is also 120. Now, some of the Adventist pioneers uh, had the idea that this might be a reference also to the end of time, because if they calculated that if you take 120 jubilees, you get to 6,000 years. Just Himes, for example, had yeah. calculations like that. But we, we won't go into those details now. But it's just interesting that there are these interesting correlations. But the point we are making here is, was there a time of judgment for the antediluvian world? Yes. yes. Does the world today believe that there was a universal flood? Mostly no. No. In fact, science says there was no universal flood, but this nice fossil here on this table tells us that there was a universal flood. Because the fossil world is buried in watery graves. In fact, fossilization needs very special circumstances, and they need water for the exchange of the minerals to take place. So this is not the original ammonite, this fossil. This is a mineralized copy of it, in other words. But it doesn't take millions of years for these things to happen. And then you have, of course, also these chalk layers, which are 
foraminifera, unicellular organisms and radiolarians, which are also deposited out of water. So the whole world must have been covered in water because this is a universal layer. So there was a universal flood and God destroyed humanity in the past and only those that were in the ark were saved. Now these serve as a type for the end of time. So my next question would be, did God really say that this judgment was a type of the final judgment? And if we go there to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, he says, And he spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. So this is quite a mouthful. So we have two typologies here. You have the destruction of the antediluvian world mm -hmm. in the days of Noah, which serve as a type of the final judgment. Mm -hmm. And Noah was a preacher of righteousness. The righteousness of Christ is going to be a central part of the final message. Yes. How are you saved? You're saved by the righteousness of Christ, yes, right? Correct. No works. What was the way of Cain? Works. Works. And Babylonian religion, what was that? Also. It was works. Yes. So this was the unique religion where you were not saved by your merits, but you were saved by an alien merit, as Martin Luther put it. A merit which was not part of you, but which came from a higher source, Jesus Christ. And these two religious systems have been in conflict since Cain and Abel. Since Cain and Abel. Now the fascinating thing is that even those that were in the truth and believed that the Lamb was the way, even they, over time, tended to revert back to the Babylonian system. So you might have the truth for a while, and then the sad apostasy comes into the people of God, and eventually they decay and become part of Babylon again. So there's this constant, constant cycle, and every time that they move away, God sends a prophet. Yes. And he brings them back, and then they fall away, and then God sends a prophet, and he brings them back. And it's just a constant ebb yes. and flow. Are we going to have the same at the end? Believe so. And then he gives this striking example of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah that were destroyed by fire and brimstone. And this serves as a type, again, for those that should live ungodly at the end of time. So in other words, there was a flood and there was a judgment. Here's the evidence. This creature is extinct, this Ammonite. Yeah. There were many, many creatures that lived before the flood that don't exist anymore. In fact, this is one of the arguments that negates the evolutionary theory. Because if evolution was right, you would have to start with a very low density of animals. Yeah. And you would have to get more and more and more variety as you continue. But in fact, we have a reverse. Yes. We have a large number of creatures in the past and we're getting fewer and fewer as we go along. So we have a reversal there, which shows that there must have been a massive creation with huge variety of animals, many of them being extinct. So the fossils are not an evidence of evolution, but evidence of a much greater diversity in times past. There's another point. The, the size is reversed. If evolution is correct, then you should evolve from small to large. Yes. It's an obvious thing. You don't start evolution with an elephant and end with an amoeba. You start with an amoeba and end off with an elephant at the end, right? But everything was bigger and greater in the past and more degenerate today and smaller. Yes. So, yes, there was a destruction in the past and God really said there would be a judgment. And we drive our vehicles 
with the evidence of that judgment. Where does all this organic matter come from that is hidden in the bowels of the earth? It's organic matter. It must have been alive, alive at some stage. So when they went into the ark, then God promised them that he would no longer destroy the world with a flood. The final destruction will be with fire, right? Genesis 9.15, did they believe God when he said, and I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. There might still be local flooding, but there won't be a universal flood. Genesis 11 verse 4 said, and they said, these are the Babylonians. Remember we're working towards the Babylonian mindset and thinking. Go, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. They actually built the tower to overcome a future flood. Yes. So they did not believe mm -hmm. God. The point that I'm trying to make is that humanity has this tendency not to believe what God really said. Yes. And if you don't believe what God really said, then what do you actually believe? It's a very important point. Yes. So did God really send Moses to deliver the people when they were in Egypt? Well, in Exodus 2 verse 14 we read, and he said, this is now the Israelite, that was being assisted and helped by Moses, who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. They didn't realize that Moses was going to be a prince and a judge over them. And he serves as a type of a greater prince and a greater judge who they also rejected, which is Jesus, right? Yes. So what I'm pointing out here is, do people really believe when God sends someone to be the prince and the judge? The answer is no. no. How much unbelief is there in the world? Did God really require a change of lifestyle when he brought, brought the children out. of Israel out of Egypt? Numbers 11.6 says, But now our soul is dried away. There's nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. We've dealt with this. So I'm not going to go into details. God's answer, And they went forth a wind from the Lord and brought quails from the sea and let them fall by the camp, as it were, a day's journey on this side, and as it were, a day's journey on the other side, around about the camp, and as it were, two cubits high upon the face of the earth. And the people stood up all that day and all that night and all that next day, and they gathered the quails. He that gathered least gathered ten homers and they spread them all abroad for themselves around about the camp. And we've discussed it before, but God was not pleased with them. Mm. Psalms tells us they lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. My point is that whatever God does, human nature rebels against it, even though it is for your own good, right? Yes. So he gave them their request, verse 15, but he sent this leanness, this emptiness into the soul. And then again in Corinthians we read, now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust of the evil things as they also lust. So all of these things in the Old Testament served as a type for God's people. And every time, if God said something, you can ask the question that you've been asking the whole time. They were asking, did God really say? I don't think he meant it. No. Maybe I don't, th I don't, I don't think he wants us correct. to have this, to do this. No, no, no. 
Do I really have to do this? Do I really have to believe this? No, God is not going to do this, right? So did God really say that his people should separate themselves from the world? This is a very complicated one. Very hard for people. Let's go to the Old Testament because we're, we're looking at type and anti-type, right? Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. Out of your country, away from your family, even away from your father's house, come out. Now that's a, a very important call. There were two calls to Abraham. The one was in in Ur, and the other one was in Haran. Haran. And if we go to the New Testament, there are two calls in the book of Revelation about Babylon. Yes. Revelation chapter 14, yeah. you have Babylon is fallen. The and then angel. Revelation chapter 18, you have Babylon is fallen. Come out, come out. So it's a very similar thing. So type and anti-type have to meet each other. So, Jesus himself reiterates this and says in Matthew 19, 29, And everyone that has forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, here's your family, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. This is not an instruction to... Avoid your family. Mm. And to sell everything now and... No, definitely not. This is an instruction to separate yourself, because we're living in the anti-type. To separate yourself from that which is against God. You have to come out of that mindset. And anything that's clinging you to the world. Yes. Get rid of that. Nothing must, must stand in your way with your relationship. Correct. In other words, God. not your father, nor your mother, nor your wife, nor your children, or anything that you own should keep you from following the truth. You must love all of them, but your love for God is the main love. Absolutely, absolutely. So did God really say that his people should separate themselves from literal Babylon? So we're going back to ancient times and then we'll come to the modern times, right? Because this, this type and typology and anti-type is, is fascinating in the Bible. Isaiah 48 verse 20. Now this is quite a while before this Babylonian takeover. He said, Go ye forth of Babylon, flee ye from the Chaldeans. With a voice of singing declare ye, tell this, utter it even to the ends of the earth. Say ye, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. Babylon is an obstacle to those who want to be part of God's plan. Yes. It's an obstacle. So, it has to do with salvation because it's redemption here, right? So you have to flee from the Babylonian mindset. Here was a literal fleeing from the Babylonian. Don't become involved with Babylonian thinking. And then Jeremiah, in the time when Babylon actually conquered Jerusalem, he says, flee, get ye far off. Dwell deep, O ye inhabitants of Hazor, says the Lord. For Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has taken counsel against you and has conceived a purpose against you. So this mighty king of Babylon, the one who was the one who took the Israelites captive, yes. he has a couple of attributes. He took counsel against God's people, mm -hmm. and he has conceived a purpose against you. So he doesn't leave you alone, does He's he? He's coming for you. He's going to come for you. Uh, what is his purpose in coming for you? To take you. He wants to conquer you. Yes. He wants to take you captive. He wants you to be his servant. Yes. So he has a, a problem with anyone who doesn't worship according to his style. 
did he enforce his way of worship? Yes. What happened to Daniel's friends? Mm -hmm. Did they have to bow down? Yes. And did they refuse? Yes. They refused. Correct. So Jeremiah 51 verse 6 says, Flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off in her iniquity. For this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her a recompense. So Babylon will be judged. And if you are part of Babylon, you will be judged together with Babylon. So when literal Babylon is destroyed, that serves as a type for anti-typical Babylon. And if you are part of anti-typical Babylon, mm -hmm. you will be destroyed together with it. So you have to come out of it. You have literally. To, you have to come out and of Babylon. Literally and mentally. Yes, absolutely. So now let's go and ask ourselves this question then. If that was the type, where's the antitype? Did God really say that his people should separate themselves from anti-typical Babylon? Now we're coming to our day. Yes. Let's read the verses. Revelation 18. This is the loud cry. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory. This is a message that has to go out universally. It's not a conspiracy. It's a message from God. Yes. And he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. Now how many times does he say it there? Twice. He says it twice. And is become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. When literal Babylon fell, there was a writing on the wall and it said many, many. Yes. There was also twice, twice because there was, of course, uh, the two kings ruling. It was Belsasa and it was his father and his father had taken care of the spiritual side and he had taken care of the political side. So it was a union of church and state. So there were two aspects to literal Babylon, the church and the state, mm -hmm. and they worked together. And here again you have the two aspects. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. There's a spiritual aspect and there is a political aspect. And it has become a habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit. There's a false Holy Spirit in this system. And a cage. What is a cage? Something that keeps you captive, right? Yes. Of every unclean and hateful bird. So here are false spirits. Because the true spirit of God is depicted as a dove. So an unclean bird, every foul, unclean, hateful bird is a false spirit. So this is demons. But then you have these sad words that all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So they all drank Babylonian wine. Doctrine. What does wine stand for? Doctrine. Doctrine. So they've swallowed Babylonian doctrine. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. So here you have the two aspects. You have the wine of Babylon, which is false doctrine. This is the ecclesiastical side. And then you have the political side, which is the kings of the world. So you have the two. Yes. They're always part and parcel of Babylon. But there's another one mentioned over here, and that's the merchants of the earth. Now, if you go back to the Old Testament, they were also the merchants. The king of Tyre, who also served as a type merchant, was very important there. Yes. And the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. So there's money in Babylon. Yes. She controls the economy. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, and here are those words again, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. 
iniquities that are against God's law and against God's word. Mm. So at the end of time, we have a system which is called anti-typical Babylon. It consists of a union of church and state. Mm -hmm. It has false doctrine. It controls the economy. And you have to separate yourself from them. That's very hard because there's an economic implication. There's a religious implication. And there's a political implication. Yes. Very hard. Now, who is Babylon? We need to know. Definitely. You can't say to someone, come out of Babylon and not say what Babylon is, no. right? If you How don't do you? have a definition, how would you know? Exactly. So, let's have a look at the three components of Babylon. It's also called a city. Babylon was a city. Revelation 16, 19, and the great city was divided into three parts. So we know that Babylon has three components. Besides being church and state, there are three other aspects. Yes. And the cities of the nations fell, and the great Babylon came into remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And I saw, in verse 13, three unclean spirits, like frogs, now, frogs were a very important Egyptian deity, yes. and they were worshipped. And one of the plagues, plagues was, was a plague yeah. of frogs, right? Came out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So those are the three components. There's the dragon component, yes. there's the beast component, and there's the false prophet component. And Jesus warned, there will be many false prophets. So the false prophet, again, is divided into many groups called many false prophets. Now, the beast was identified by the Reformation very clearly, even in pre-Reformation times, as the Roman Catholic system. Mm -hmm. The dragon is associated with the religion of the dragon, in other words, spiritism, in all its manifestations. And the false prophet you find in Revelation chapter 13 is associated particularly with the second beast of Revelation chapter 13, and that is Protestantism yes. that has reverted back to the Babylonian principles. Yes. So those three components. So all the world's religions will fall into one of these three categories. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So there's going to be a conflict between the mindset of Babylon and God's people. Okay, and who's going to be involved on the Babylonian side? The kings of the earth? Mm -hmm. Everybody in the world will be influenced by this, so you have to make a, a choice, and there will be a conflict. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. Here again you have this allusion to nakedness. The robe of righteousness should cover you. So here you have righteousness by faith. Remember Noah was a preacher of righteousness mm -hmm. and Abel accepted righteousness by faith in the blood of the Lamb yes. and Cain refused to accept it. And he gathered them together into a place called in Hebrew tongue Armageddon, mountain of Megiddo, where the great conflict between the priests of Baal took place. Mm. And here is this massive conflict. So this is steeped in Old Testament typologies. Yes. The great conflict at the end of time. And we need to understand this because our life depends on it. We have to make a choice. Mm where we stand. 
Now, I said that the reformers had identified the beast as Catholicism. Now, let me make it quite plain. We're talking about a system. We're not talking about people. People have to make individual choices. And just because a system is defined as being part of Babylon, and we'll see why, mm. doesn't make the people Babylonians necessarily, because they could be deceived, right? So Bible, the Bible tells us quite clearly that God says, come out of her who? My people. My people. Mm. So where are God's people largely situated? Yes, in that system. In that system. But they have to come out. Mm. Now, Catholics are very sincere believers. And if you take the great reformers in the Reformation, they were all Catholic. Yes. And yet they became the great reformers, like Martin Luther and Melanchthon and what they were all called, right? So we're not talking about individuals. This is not an attack on anyone that is a Catholic. It is a exposition of the system. What is wrong with the system? I mean, after all, I was a Roman Catholic, but I'm no longer a Roman Catholic because I've recognized that the system mm -hmm. is not in harmony with God's word. Yes. So we'll have to look at that. Now, here is a book that was written in 1946, and it comes from Moody Press. So this is a, a beautiful little book. It's a very thin little book. And if you look it up on Amazon, you can see that it can go for an exorbitant price. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because it's basically out of print, right? Yeah. But uh, this was in 1946, and I, I found it very fascinating to see what the Moody Press had to say about uh, this issue, the Bible and the Roman Church. The Reformers regarded the Holy Scripture as the sole rule of faith and practice. And the sons of the Reformers throw the sole rule out of the window. That's interesting. Yes. Torn to shreds by the deft, impious hands of the critic. With the Bible goes the God of the Bible. And when we charge Rome with a literal idolatry for her veneration of images, relics, and so forth, she comes back with an accusation of intellectual idolatry, in that Protestantism, having rejected the God of Revelation, has created a new God, the product of apostate thinking. Now, this is not an Adventist source. This is Moody Press. They realize that there are many, many people, thousands, living in Protestant churches who realize where the problem lies. Mm. Why they have become the product of apostate thinking. And why, as a consequence, they've actually aligned themselves with Babylon and become part of the Babylonian system. Do you remember that document we discussed the other day? Yes, Jubilee for the Earth. Jubilee for the Earth. Mm. Isn't it incredible how steeped in Babylonian wine that document yes. is? It actually comes forward as if it's not a Protestant document. Exactly. As if it was and written by one of them. And how many people are sitting in Protestant churches today and they look at the morality that is being proposed, and they look at the, the doctrines, how they're being reinterpreted, and they are literally devastated. Some of them are in tears, mm. but they don't know where to go. And so they're stuck in the system. So this is not a new on. thing. This was in 1946. Moody Press already realized this. So they've created a new God, the product of apostate thinking. Rome is not afraid of modernism. It is a fruitful fishing pool, because the human heart cannot be satisfied with the vague, vaporous uncertainties of modernism. Rome addresses herself to those who are under the influence of that emasculated brand of Protestantism 
and offers the authority of the church founded by Jesus Christ in place of the bewildering uncertainties of indifferentism. It's brilliantly put. Mm. So here comes Rome and says, you know, you are a ship adrift upon an ocean with nowhere to go because you have given up on the principles of the Bible, you've attached yourself to modernism and now look at you, your morality has gone out of the window, you have no anchor. Come to Mother Church mm -hmm. and I will give you an anchor. So then your affiliation has to shift from the God of the Bible to a person who claims to be the representative of God here on earth. It's a very dangerous um, thing to be, like it's stated there, uh, Rome is not, that doesn't um, distance itself from moder modernism. No, it doesn't. It embraces it. Absolutely. Because in that way it can uh -huh. grab more. It uh -huh. continues and he writes here, all this has to do with modernism. What about our evangelicalism? We profess the supreme authority of God and of His Word, but how does it work out in our lives? It is not only possible, but all too common to be evangelical in doctrine and modernist in practice, giving mental assent to the great doctrinal tenets of the faith once delivered to the saints and at the same time refusing obedience to the standards of the gospel living enunciated with equal authority in the Holy Writ. Everything goes, right? Yeah. In Protestantism today, everything goes. There is no rule as to diet, for example. Mm. There is no rule as to dress mm. or uh, Anything modern, anything, anything. Any, uh, the way you worship even. Now that doesn't mean that there are not individuals who are doing the very best they can yes. to worship God according to his principles. And how he believes is right. Yes, and they are sighing and crying for all the evil that is done in the world. He continues, it is one thing to study the scriptures for theological exactness, another to submit to them for the regulation, regulating of one's life. Dogmatically, we acknowledge Christ Jesus as Lord, which title we hold as the title of his deity. Then how can we yield other than practical submission to him as the Lord of our lives and the God of our salvation? Now, I like this because this is not an Adventist, and he's saying you have to have an orderly life. You have to live according to the principles. Today, if you say that, you're a fanatic. Yeah. Full consecration and complete obedience are only logical answer to our profession as evangelicals. Rome points to the modernist brand of Protestantism as a fine example of that scripture which says, in those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. It's ours to demonstrate that there is a king in Israel. See, we want, we want a savior, but we don't necessarily want a king to rule over us. Mm. A king has rules. Yes. A king has laws. So, Protestantism today is a fruitful fishing field for Rome because there's no anchor because they've given up on has God really said these things they don't believe it anymore they don't believe that God really said there was a flood they don't believe that God really said this that that and the other so then what do you believe here's an interesting book by Strom on the conscience, and it's the secularization of conscience. And here's an abstract. Conscience was emancipated from institutional religion during the era of the Enlightenment. So it was separated. And it is often thought that this was due to secularization during that time. Paradoxically, it could be said that it was the consequence of the 16th and 17th century evangelical fervor. That's an interesting statement. Mm -hmm. 
The relationship between conscience and organized religion did not end then altogether. It enjoys considerable support in institutionalized Christianity. The divine presence still exists quite strongly in the notions of conscience. The secularization of conscience examines how conscience drifted from its strong Christian ties and became unchurched and was adopted by 18th century philosophers. Enlightenment philosophers rejected a narrow conception of conscience and opened its deliberations to larger horizons of social consensus. In other words, what he's saying is that your conscience in the past used to be dictated by your religious convictions. But now it has been emancipated from your religious convictions and your conscience is now being dictated to by social consensus. Mm. So what is right and what is wrong is not determined by the word of God. It is not determined by your religion. It is determined by your social environment. Yes, very dangerous. Very, very dangerous because where's your anchor? You can go from one social environment to another and be in a totally different social crowd with totally different norms. Yes. And we don't even have to go into the details. People can think for themselves, right? If, some, if in one group something is acceptable, it doesn't necessarily make it right. Exactly. So what is your basis for morality according to the scripture? Now, Here's a quote from the Spirit of Prophecy. This is an Adventist view. The Great Lesson Book. Study the Word. The Word is the Great Lesson Book for the students in our schools. The Bible teaches the whole will of God concerning the sons and daughters of Adam. The Bible is the rule of life, teaching us of the character we must form for the future immortal life. Our faith, our practice may make us living epistles known and read of all men. Men need not the dim light of tradition and custom to make the scriptures comprehensible. It is just as sensible to suppose that the sun shining in the heavens at noonday needs the glimmering of the torchlight of earth to increase its glory. The fables or the utterances of priests or of ministers are not needed to save the student from error. Consult the divine oracle and you have light. In the Bible every duty is made plain, every lesson is comprehensible, able to fit men for a preparation for eternal life. So clearly the Bible is the standard of morality. Yes. Here's another quote. The gift of Christ and the illumination of the Holy Spirit reveal to us the Father and the Son. The Word is exactly adapted to make men and women and youth wise unto salvation. In the Word is the science of salvation plainly revealed. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Search the scriptures, for therein is the counsel of God, the voice of God speaking to the soul. The word of God is the basis of morality. This is what Protestants used to believe. The word. This is what Adventism teaches. The word of God gets you onto that higher plane. It gets you onto the higher plane. Youth, in the name of Jesus, I appeal to you whom I shall soon meet around the throne of God. Study your Bible. It will prove to you not only the pillar of cloud by day, but the pillar of light of fire by night. It opens before you a path leading up and still upwards, bidding you go forward. The Bible, you do not know its worth. It is the book for the mind, for the heart, for the conscience, the will and the life. It is the message of God to you in such simple style that it meets the comprehension of a little child. So the Bible is the norm and the standard. 
Now, the official Bible of the Roman Church is the Vulgate. That was accepted by the Council of Trent to be the only infallible Bible in contrast to the Protestant Bible. So we're back to manuscripts, right? Yes. This comes from Moody Press, page 19. And this is that same little book by Macaulay in 1946, The Bible and the Roman Church. And he writes, when the Vulgate was issued by Pope Sixtus V to the accomplishment of anathemas against any who would change a word of it, it was so full of corruption that it had to be withdrawn and revised, and was reissued by Clementine VIII, still under the name of Sixtus. Now this is not an Adventist source again, this is Moody Press. Yes. So the Vulgate was so full of corruptions. Now, if you think about what has influenced the mind of man to move away from a thus says the Lord, there are so many isms. Let's go some of them, the origin of species. It's also interesting when mm -hmm. they were released. So here is the introduction to the origin of species and it says, the mystery of mysteries, as it has been called by one of our great philosophers. So Darwin says he started thinking about it in 1837, but he actually put it on paper in the year 1844. Mm. And then he sent it to everyone, and then he finally wrote the book after that. So 1844 is the date in which, according to the Origin of Species, this book was being conceived. Now, 1844 is an interesting date, right? And this, this theory has done more than many other theories to discredit the Bible and to uh, remove the faith of the believers from the Bible. Yes. And that's why we have all those lectures on evolution. If people want to look, if you put I'll, the links in before, I'll you can put, put them again, again. Especially also your lecture on 1844, the day that changed the world. Correct. And no. also with Darwinism, even if you didn't become an atheist, you've got a lot of people that actually believe, they believe as they're Protestants, you're, you are Christian. But then there's some portion that you don't completely believe what God has God said yes you maybe say okay this earth was created in six periods correct but not literal days so that the roots of Darwinism is actually very deep absolutely and theistic evolution is another major problem because theistic evolution leads you to the conclusion that death is the mechanism for achieving greatness through natural selection. But according to the scripture, death is a consequence of sin. So there was no death in the beginning, so it couldn't have been a mechanism for evolution. Yeah. So it totally negates the gospel. It's also interesting that in the same year, 1844, the Sinaitic manuscript Codex Sineticus was discovered at Mount Sinai. And if you look here, if we, if we take the text from the King James Version of Genesis 3.15, which is based on the received text, then it says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is the great promise of redemption in Jesus Christ. And uh, the seed of the woman, of course, between the seed of the woman, which is the church, and the seed of the devil, which is his church, and mm -hmm. there will be enmity between them until the end. And the seed, being singular, as Paul says, will come, which is Christ, and he will bruise or crush the head of the serpent, mm -hmm. and Christ will be injured in the heel. But if you take the Douay Rhymes, which is the Jesuit version, which is the Catholic counter to the Reformation Bible, they put it this way, I will put enmities between thee and the woman, and thy seed and her seed, and she shall crush thy head, and thou shalt lie in wait for her heel. So they make it a reference to Mary. So now Jesus has been taken out of the picture, but clearly 
uh, this is the way in which it should have been put. Mm. So in other words, it is a masculine form and not a feminine form. Also fascinating is on May the 8th, 1844, I mean, a lot of things happened in that year, right? <laughs> yes. The leader of the Roman Catholic Church, Pope Gregory XVI, sent a letter to the members of the Catholic hierarchy condemning the Bible societies as basically enemies of Catholicism and argued against what he termed the indiscriminate circulation of the scriptures to lay people. This letter was published in the New York Herald on July 15, 1844, and it reads in part as follows. Those Bible societies only care audaciously to stimulate all to a private interpretation of the divine oracles, to inspire contempt for divine traditions, which the Catholic Church preserves upon the authority of the Holy Fathers. So if you read the Bible, and you interpret the Bible together with uh, the Holy Spirit, then according to Rome, you are deviating from her yes. principles. The reading of the Holy Bible translated into the vulgar or common tongue should not be permitted, except to confirm people in the faith. No version whatever should be permitted to be read but those which should be approved of the Holy See. Accompanied by notes derived from the writings of the Holy Fathers or other learned Catholic authorities. So Rome tells you that only they will interpret the Bible. We confirm and renew the decrees against the publication, distribution, reading and possession of the books of the Holy Scriptures translated into the vulgar tongue. Why well, don't I have that problem anymore today? That was in 1844. They had a major problem. Why yes. don't they have it anymore? Maybe because the Holy See approved the new Bibles. Aha! Uh -huh. So if you can place contempt upon the Protestant versions and accept the Roman Catholic versions, then you're fine, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the Bible actually warns that there will be an assault on the Word. 2 Corinthians 2.17 There are a number of verses here from Corinthians and Jeremiah and, and Peter. Let's read some of them. For we are not as many as corrupt the Word of God. So there will be people that corrupt God's Word or handle the Word of God deceitfully, or steal words out of the Word of God. Jeremiah, I'm against the prophets, says the Lord, that steal my words. In other words, don't say what I've actually said or change it. Mm -hmm. Pervert the words of the living God. Or Peter, rest as they do the other scriptures, take them out of context. So these are all artful ways of the devil, right? Yes. Has God really said mm -hmm. it should be like this or like that? And which manuscript are you going to use? Now, we've dealt with that, so we're not going to deal with it again. Or what about making the Word of God of non-effect? Darwinism, right? Yes. Oh, oh, yeah, there's a story. It's an allegory. It's a little fairy tale about a flood and an ark and a this and a that. Make it of non-effect. Yes. Or Romans 1.25, change the truth of God into a lie. Is that possible? It says you can take God's word and change it into a lie. Cast down the truth. This was one of the attributes of the little horn power. It cast down the truth to the ground and it practiced and it prospered. It was very successful. Well, we can see it's been very successful. Or Revelation 6, 9, And I saw under the altar the souls of them which had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. So, is there a war around God's word? Oh, definitely. Oh. Could you be killed for it? Yes. Have people been killed for it? Millions. Millions. Can it happen again? I think the Bible says it will. Ah. Uh -huh. So obviously there's been a rebellion, right? Against God's word. Here's a statement from Second Selected Messengers. I question whether genuine rebellion is ever curable. 
studying patriarchs and prophets, the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. This rebellion was extended including more than two men. It was led by 250 princes of the congregation, men of renown. Oh. This makes me scared because type can meet anti-type. Do you think we could have people in our own midst? These are the children of Israel who are in rebellion against God's word or rebellion against the testimonies. Could it be that there are princes of the congregation, leaders in the church that are in this category? We really have to question ourselves. Men of renown, call rebellion by its right name and apostasy by its right name and then consider that the experience of the ancient people of God with all its objectionable features was faithfully chronicled to pass into history. The scripture declares, these things are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come, 1 Corinthians 10, 11. And if men and women who have the knowledge of the truth are so far separated from their great leader that they will take the great leader of apostasy and name him Christ our righteousness, it is because they have not sunk deep into the minds of the truth. They are not able to distinguish the precious ore from the base material. Oh, we dealt with the shaking. There will be a shaking. Because we have people in our midst that don't believe the plainest statements in the Bible. And when you discuss the book of Revelation, they call it a conspiracy theory, if you put it into the context of modern times. Yes. I th if you use the modern or to the signs happening all over us today, then you will be labeled a conspiracy theorist. You will be labeled a conspiracy theorist. I, I, I like what one man says, the only person, the only people who believe in conspiracy theories are those of us who have studied them. <laughs> Revelation 20 verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. This war has been raging since the time of Cain and Abel, mm -hmm. and this war will rage till the end of time. Now what have these people done? when they come into conflict with what system? Why should they be beheaded for the witness of Jesus and the word of God? Because they refuse to worship the beast. Yes. Or his image. Fallen Protestantism. Church and state coming together. Neither have received the mark upon their foreheads. The mark of our ecclesiastical power is that we've changed the Sabbath, right? And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years, the millennium. Now we've dealt with these before, but just for the sake of clarity, let's put them there again. Now what does Satan propose to do? He proposes that he is capable of changing this Bible. These parties that fell understand all about heaven. And they can bring in the different sentiments from the Bible and they are going to have a revision of it. You will see. They will make revisions of the Bible, but every one of us needs to stand intelligently on the Word. We cannot afford to be careless, but we must have that simplicity of godliness that is a virtue to us. We must have it. So, I'm a bit scared of all these revisions of the Bible. And I like the... Protestant Bibles based on the received text. So the old German Luther Bible, the German Schlachter Bible, the old Afrikaans translation in South Africa, uh, the King James Version, or any English Bible based on the received text, which with none of the Babylonian changes in it. Isn't it true that most of the opposition that you, we have been receiving for the past three months is in the interpretation that people get from the Bible, but then uses modern 
once. Exactly. Well, we discussed that for this, the sanctuary, for example. You, you cannot even talk about it with the new translation. It's so muddled. It is the mind and character of the persons who study the scriptures that makes the study dangerous. The difficulties will be removed from the way of those who search the scriptures with earnest, humble hearts, praying to the Lord for wisdom. Don't read into the Bible what your preconceived idea says. There's to be no cutting out of scripture, no mutilating of the words as the Catholics have done. This is a very plain statement. The Bible is to be searched as a whole. The thing in it hard to be understood will become plain through the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it doesn't say through the enlightenment of the theologian. Yes. It says through the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. Tyndall, in fact, said to the theologians of his day that he will make a plowboy. To mm. know more of the scripture. Exactly. Then. Exactly. Do you desire to destroy the covenant between yourselves and your God? A perpetual covenant means just what it says. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, declares, God declares. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. This is our evidence. You will see ere long that there will be those who will become weary of hearing repeated the things they ought to do, but do not desire to do, and they will change the wording of the Bible. We know what the Lord says in Revelation about those who do that. A perpetual covenant is a perpetual covenant. You can't change God's word. Now, Rome has used its influence to change the Bible. And even within Protestant councils, they have placed their influence there yes. and they have tried to change the Bible. I mean, read the Douay rhymes, which we read, where Mary will be the one that will crush the head of the serpent. That is such a blatant apostasy against the word of God. The Jesuits are against the Protestant Bible. And here's a quote from the Jesuits in history. And it says, this is the, what the Jesuits said about the Bible. They said, then the Bible, that serpent with its head erect and eyes flashing, threatens us, the Jesuits, with its venom while its trails along the ground shall be changed into a rod as soon as we, the Jesuits, are able to seize it. For three centuries past, this cruel asp has left us no repose. You well know with what folds it entwines us and what fangs it gnaws us. They hate the scriptures. And they don't base their theology on the scriptures. Now this is not just an accusation. This is not a conspiracy either. This is a fact. Yes. We can study what they write, and we can see. So, to all our Catholic friends out there, this is no accusation against you as a Catholic. This is a request. Study your Bible and see if it harmonizes what, with what the Church teaches. And if it doesn't, then flee. Flee from Babylon. But this is also for the other Protestants. Absolutely. With their if the, the Bible and their versions of the Bible that they read. Correct. It, it or some of them don't school. even read the whole Bible. They just want portions of the Bible. So the authority of the Holy Spirit re is replaced by the authority of man when you take God out of the equation. Cardinal Hosius, president of the Great Council of Trent, which is that council where Protestantism and Catholicism split, right? Affirmed that apart from the authority of the church, the scripture would have no more weight than the fables of Aesop. That's quite a statement. It comes from Wiley, the papacy. So this is a very reputable source. Mm. So, according to Rome, the Bible has no authority whatsoever unless it is interpreted 
by the church. It's interesting that in uh, Orthodox Jewish circles you have the same thing. It has to be interpreted by the rabbis because the layman hasn't got the right to interpret the scriptures. So they support this position by invoking 2 Peter 1 verse 20, but they totally ignore verse 21. Because verse 20 says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is in any private interpretation. So they say, okay, the church has to interpret it for you. But verse 21 says, For the prophecy came not in old times by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So who's the interpreter? The Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is the interpreter, not the church. Herein lies the answer to both the error of private interpretation and the heresy of papal interpretation. Because you can have a private interpretation, and that's heretical. You can read into it what you want, and you can change the wording to take out what is objectionable. Matthew 11 verse 28 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Christ says, come to me directly. Yes. You don't have to go via a system. Or verse 23 in John 14, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. So, what is your duty according to Christ? It doesn't say, if a man love me, he will follow the directors of the church. He says, if a man love me, he will keep my words. Where do I find these words? In the Bible. 1 John 2.20 But you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. So who is your teacher? God. 1 John 2 verse 27 But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you. It's pretty clear. But as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it has taught you, ye shall abide in him. We don't need a human being. Sometimes it's good to listen to advice and to read what other people have said. But in the final analysis, you have to say to yourself, what is God saying? What is God saying? If you take the Sabbath issue, and you read in the Bible, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. And the minister says, we keep the first day. Is there Which a problem? Did yeah. God really say? God really say? So now let's get to the nitty gritty. And ask ourselves, what is the doctrine of the serpent? And what is the doctrine of devils that we find in Babylon? Because it must be one and the same, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to understand what Babylon teaches and we need to separate ourselves from it. And the criterion must be the Word of God. Yes. Genesis chapter 3. This is where we actually started. <laughs> <laughs> and now the serpent, serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made and had said unto the woman, Yea, has God said, ye shall not eat of every tree in the, of the garden? Here's that questioning. And of course the serpent wasn't the subtlety. It was the one who was using him as a medium, yes. the devil himself. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. God is very fair, right? He didn't put it in an obscure place. He put it right there in the middle. Confronted by choices. Are we confronted by choices? Yes, every Absolutely. Day. Are they just sort of vague there, someone? Or are they quite prominent? Prominent. But the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. There's his first 
blatant contradiction of God's word. Mm. For God knows that in the day ye eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods. There's his second blatant contradiction. You will be immortal. In fact, you will be like God. And the third contradiction, you will know good and evil. You yourself will determine what is right and what is wrong. Mm. You don't need God to tell you what is right and what is wrong. You will tell yourself what is right and what is wrong. You will be totally independent. You will be indestructible. So let's look at that first lie. You shall not surely die. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. He didn't receive a living soul, he became a living soul. So the dust of the ground plus the breath, the metabolism, made him a living soul. Now you have to have both of these. There must be the dust that's and right. the breath, and that's a soul. There's not a soul existing separately no. from this. So you're either alive and you're metabolizing, you have a respiratory activity, or you are dead. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Now that's contrary to what most people believe today. They think that you are very wise up there and know many things, but the dead know nothing. Neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. The dead. Isaiah tells us in chapter 26, verse 19, Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead body shall they arise, awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out her dead. So the Old Testament teaches very plainly that when you die, you are dust, but there will be a resurrection. And they will come up together. Together with my dead body, we will rise. So there will be a death, and there will be a resurrection. Daniel confirms it and says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So there's a resurrection of life and there's a resurrection of death. So there's a judgment. And death is called a sleep. Mm -hmm. Psalms 37 verse 27, But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs, they shall consume into smoke, they shall consume away. So in other words, those that are resurrected to receive eternal damnation, what happens to them? Fire comes down, the Bible says in Revelation, and consumes them, and they will consume away. They will be as though nothing left. they never were. Deuteronomy 5.25 says, Now therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us, talking about the fire on Mount Sinai, if we hear the voice of the Lord our God any more, then we shall die. It's interesting that those who live in the presence of God actually live in that eternal fire. Yes, they walk they're in the fire. And the devil turns it around. He's the master of reversal. He says the damnation is to live eternally in the fire. And that is to be damned. No, to be saved is to live eternally yes. in the fire. Where did Lucifer, before he fell? He walked amongst the fiery yeah. stones. Yes. What about the three worthies? Yes. They weren't consumed in the fire because they were in the presence of God and God protected them with his righteousness. And there's beautiful symbolism in Revelation to, um, of Jesus that also has fire in his eyes and I think... Yes, he's like burnished brass. brass yeah. So. Even Satan will be destroyed, according to the scripture. Ezekiel 28, 18 says, Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes, 
upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. So the final destruction is by fire and the consequences of this fire is eternal. Now, now we're gonna, not going to do a major Bible study on the state of the dead, but you could perhaps put a link in there. I will. As it is one of the pillars that we said, that is yes. the, we haven't spoken of, but we, you've done pretty much a good explanation of it now. There's and a, I will also put some Yeah, there's a more it. detailed one. I think it's called the mystic realm of death. Yes. And put that in the links. But now, the point of this is to see what does Rome teach? Mm. Now here's the office of the Catechism and regarding this verse. Article 366 of the Catechism says, The Church, not the Bible, mm. teaches that every spiritual soul is immortal. It does not perish when it separates from the body at death. The Bible says something else. Do they know what the Bible says? It's important that they say the church teaches that. Here's the New Catholic Encyclopedia. So obviously they are aware of what the Bible teaches. And it says, human immortality. The soul in the Old Testament means not a part of a man, but the whole man as a living being. Mm. That's exactly what the scripture said. The dust plus the breath, a man became a living Beings. being. Yeah. So they know what the scripture teaches. Similarly, in the New Testament, it signifies human life. So it's the human being. The life of the individual conscious object, the human being. And then it talks about how they interpret it. They've maintained that the New Testament, the, new, the recent exegesis, does not teach the immortality of the soul in the Hellenistic sense of survival of an immortal principle after death. So the Bible doesn't teach what people believe today. Mm. That is actually a Greek philosophy, yes. that there is a soul that separates from the body at death. Yes. So the Roman Catholic Church says, we as a church teach that you are immortal, you will not die. We know that the Bible does not teach it, but we prefer the Greek philosophy. Yes, that's what's actually, exactly what they're saying. That's what they're saying. So the Bible says one thing and they're saying another thing. And they put it on, they have the authority because they're the church. Okay, now what are they believing? Are they believing the serpent or are they believing the word of God? Serpent. It's the serpent theology? Yes. Okay, let's just make sure. This is Pope Leo X who on Monday, December 19, 1513, issued a bull declaring, We do condemn and reprobate all who assert that the intelligent soul is mortal. This bull was directed against the growing heresy of those who denied the natural immortality of the soul and avowed the conditional immortality of man. Now it's interesting that Martin Luther himself came to believe that when you die, you sleep in the dust. So he was actually subject to this bull. It's also interesting that the Lutherans today scrapped that belief of his. They don't put it into their catechism. Sure. So what are they believing? The immortality of the soul. So they believe what Rome teaches. Yes. So is that Babylonian doctrine or is that Biblical doctrine? Babylonian. It's Babylonian. Okay. Just to be clear, that means they believe when you die, your soul still lives on. Yes. Now, remember there's a dragon component in the beast. And we said that all religions that have the dragon aspect in other words, what he teaches must also have this belief. So let's go to Spiritism. Even early Spiritist leaders admitted that their communication was with Satan himself. In Spriton, a Norwegian Spiritist periodical, the following statement is made. Spiritism is the serpent in paradise offering man to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's a very interesting statement. Yes. Moses Hull, 
a leading spiritist lecturer of that early time makes the following statement, a truthful snake. In answer to the question, who then are we to believe, God or Satan? I answer, the facts in every case in the Bible justify us in believing Satan. He has ever been truthful, this is more than can be said of the other one. It was not the devil, but God who made the mistake in the Garden of Eden. It was God and not the devil who was a murderer from the beginning. Sure. That's quite mm. stunning, right? All right, this is pretty direct from the Spiritus. It comes from Spriton, December 15, 1889. And uh, another source is Facts of Faith, page 208. Now, my question is this. Uh, in essence, what Rome teaches is exactly the same. They mm. don't spell it out like this, but they believe the serpent, right? Yes, because the serpent said you will surely not die. And so that's, that's what they teach. So that's serpent theology. Mm -hmm. Now, what do the other major religions believe? They believe exactly, exactly the same the thing, same. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's interesting, here's the house of the Fox sisters where modern spiritism was born. Yes. It says, the birthplace of modern spiritism, upon this site stood the Hydesville cottage, the home of the Fox sisters, and uh, where the spirit world was established, March 31, 1848, there is no death, there are no dead. So that is basically the teaching. But of course it started before 1848. Yeah. Actually if we go back in history, Mother Anne Lee started off the Quakers on the road to quaking mm. the spirit world into the modern society. And they also denied the bodily resurrection. This was an issue between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, yes. right? and communicated with the spirits in seance-type meetings, and the time just before 1844. But in 1844 the rapping started in the house that would be made famous by the Fox sisters. So again we have that date, date 1844. So it seems as if Rome and Spiritism are on the same page when it comes to the state of the dead. Yes. And Protestantism? It's also gone over. It's also on that same page. Yes. So, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet all have this doctrine in common. And if you separate yourself from that doctrine and believe something else, then according to them, you will be a heretic. Mm. And the Pope put it in an anathema, right? So he put it into one of his decrees. Now, let us go to the other ones. But I think perhaps we should do that in a further... In a follow-up. In a follow-up. Then we will do the others, which become very interesting, mm -hmm. where the issue is that you will become gods, which is the basis of the New Age movement. Mm -hmm. And who's behind that New Age movement? And then, of course, the issue of determining for yourself, outside of Scripture, what the basis of morality is. And when we understand that these doctrines of the system are totally contrary to the Bible, then we can get a clearer understanding of what constitutes the Babylonian mindset and what it is that God's people must separate from. Yes, what do they have to come out of? Thanks. So, till the next episode. Will you pray for us? I will us? pray for us. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the blessings that we can receive from you. We ask that you bless all of us and keep us till the next episode. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you for watching this video. To subscribe, click here. When the bell appears, click and you will receive notifications. To watch the next one, Click here. Thank you again and see you next time.